Good afternoon, Wake Tech students and faculty. <laughs> My name is uh, Ariel Darnell, and I am a honors program student, and I've been in the honors program now since last semester. Uh, I'm currently finishing up my last semester of honors program classes, so I am able to graduate in the spring with my AA and have an honors program cord, which is pretty cool. Um, being in the honors program has taught me a lot about leadership, uh, responsibility, and pretty much how the world around us works as a whole. It has challenged uh, my ideals and general knowledge kind of pushing me towards limits I never knew possible. Um, as part of the honors program, we have now developed something amazing called the Honors Speaker Series, which has been introduced none other than our own faculty member here at Wake Tech, Mr. Jeffrey Harris, who's sitting in the audience with us today. <laughs> now, this new series provides honors program students, and not even just honors program students, but any students or faculty members that get a chance to talk with scholars um, and kind of learn about their research and what they're doing currently in their fields of study. Now, before I introduce our guest speaker today, um, I want to remind everyone that we have sign-up sheets outside of the auditorium here. Uh, that will be where you need to sign your name so you can get either extra credit opportunity or just say that you were here to attend the speech. And now, dun, 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 it is my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker at the official Honors Program Speaker Series, Dr. Philippe de Brigard. Uh, today we have the honor of having him speak on the neuroscience of mental time travel. Now, Dr. de Brigard holds positions in the Duke Department of Philosophy, the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, and Duke Institute for Brain Sciences. His research on counterfactual thought is published in the current edition of Scientific American Mind. So on behalf of all of us here at Wake Tech Community College, let's give a grand warm welcome to Mr. Dr. Philippe de Brigard. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for um, having me. Thanks, Jeff, for inviting me. It is really an honor to be here. So I usually start my talks uh, by reminding people that uh, I do have an accent, and as a result, sometimes I mispronounce things. If that happens, there are two possibilities. They're mutually exclusive. You can either giggle behind my back, because usually they're funny, or you can ask, but they're mutually exclusive. So if you laugh, you cannot giggle. I mean, if you, if you giggle, you cannot ask. If you can ask, um, you cannot giggle. I tell that to my students. Uh, but I just want to make sure that if um, anything that I say does not come across very clearly, please feel free to raise your hand uh, and, uh, and then I can clarify it. Today's talk is, um, is a little bit autobiographical. I'm going to tell you um, a bit about my own um, sort of travel through the mysteries of memory and imagination. So um, I'm going to start by a very obvious fact about me, which is I studied philosophy. I majored in philosophy. I did a master's in philosophy, and I did a PhD in philosophy. Um, nonetheless, I, study, I work in a center that does neuroscience, and I want to show you also uh, how those two things can interact. So um, let's start off with uh, this very interesting quote. In, in 1899, uh, George Frederick Stout, that happened also to be the first editor of a journal called Mind, um, was endeavored to write a manual of psychology. It was the second manual of psychology written in English, the first one written in Britain, the first one being uh, The Principles of Psychology written by, uh, by William James in 1890. So he was asked to write a manual of psychology, which today will be um, uh, essentially a textbook for psychology. And in the chapter of memory, he starts off by saying, memory is the revival of ideas. It is merely reproductive and does not involve transformation of what is revived in accordance with present conditions. Such revival requires the objects of past experiences to be reinstated in, in the order and the manner of the original occurrence. Now, this is, of course, over 100 years old. And what I really like about this, um, this little paragraph is that every statement in that paragraph is false. 
Uh, what we know about memory today is basically the opposite of what George Frederick Stout thought memory was. However, there is a group of academics that have been for quite some time reluctant to accept that Stout was wrong. I'm talking about philosophers, of course. And one of the reasons why philosophers were so reluctant to accept that uh, Stout was wrong is because many of them believed in what it is called in philosophy the factivity constraint, which is the idea that one can only remember that which is the case. Remembering, according to many philosophers, is what they call a factive verb. You can only remember things that were facts. It's like knowledge. Knowledge is a factive verb. You can only know things that are facts, that are true. You can ignore things uh, that are factual, like the fact that, as, as, as I gave the example before, um, you, you can say I ignored in the 14th century that the earth, was, that the earth is round and wrongly believe that it is flat but you cannot know that the Earth is flat. Why? Because the, the fact is that the Earth is not, is not flat. You can only know facts. And likewise, philosophers thought you can only remember facts. And they thought that the way in which you can um, sort of distinguish between what it, we commonly know as false memories from true memories is that there is some sort of act of imagination, a slip of the hand of your imagination that, that somehow had made your memory malfunction. In fact, up until 1983, in this uh, quote from Kurtzman, most philosophers would just simply accept that every act of misremembering or every false memory is just simply your memory system malfunctioning. But then, of course, that ignited my curiosity. Look, we have, all of us have false memories. If I ask right now, how many of you have ever had at least one false memory that you know of, I'm pretty sure that everyone will raise their hands. Everyone has had at least one false memory, and if I am right, many of our memories are actually false. It's that you never get evidence to the contrary of what you think. So why would we have a cognitive system that malfunctions so frequently and so systematically? Why on earth are we going to evolve a system that has such a high rate of malfunctioning? Maybe I thought at that point, and this is the autobiographical component of my talk, when I first started my graduate school, I was thinking, well, maybe we just got the function of memory wrong. But how could it be the case that we got the function of memory wrong? What could memory be for if not for remembering? Well, when I first started asking this question, I have got involved in a lot of research on this idea that memory is reconstructive. So um, one of the most um, famous names in, the, uh, in this sort of notion that memory is reconstructive was a social psychologist in 1932 called Bartlett. Bartlett had a very famous experiment. He asked individuals to remember a short story involving a war with ghosts. And he gave it to very different kinds of populations, people who um, were uh, natives from certain countries, uh, people who had a certain uh, standard of living, people who have like lower standards of living, and then later on he asked them to, re to report that story. And what he discovered is that depending on which group of people they belonged to and what their narrative practices were, they would report the story very differently. So he said like, look, memory seems to be reconstructive. We sort of remember the gist of the general idea, but we reconstruct the details very differently. Uh, in addition to that, another piece of the puzzle here is that it turns out that false and distorted memory usually have an air of plausibility to them. Um, people call this air of plausibility to false memories with different names. Sometimes they call it schema consistent or they are plausible or they are just driven. Um, and at that time I was very interested to try to formalize this notion of schema consistency. Uh, and uh, I came up with a mathematical model, a probabilistic model of false recognition, of which I'm going to talk about in just a second. But to give you a, a general idea of how the model works, um, the idea is that when we false alarm, when we have a false memory, what we are false, al false alarming to is what it is the most probable item given a certain cue. And my suggestion is, as I will explain in a second, is that the process of memory retrieval can be captured by a model in which the prediction error is minimized by trying out hypotheses as to how a scene, let's say, might have been given previous knowledge and a present cue. So let me just give you an example of what this means. This is a very famous experiment from uh, 1978 from Elizabeth Loftus. Uh, 
In this experiment, what she did was the following. Many, many of you might be familiar with this experiment. She showed people uh, this short clip. In reality, they were actually slides presented one after another that lasted for about eight seconds of a car. Turns out it's a Datsun. It's a red Datsun failing to stop in a corner where there is a traffic sign. Half of the participants saw a traffic sign that was a stop sign, whereas the other half saw a traffic sign that says a yield sign. Okay? Now, later on, all the participants were, at, oh, and it turns out that the red Datsun fails to stop at this sign, and then there's another incoming car, and then there's a car accident. Now, after that happened, um, the experimenters gave participants a series of questions that uh, they needed to answer yes or no to. There are 20 questions. All these questions were about facts from the scene that they just saw, that they just saw for eight seconds. Now, the critical thing is that one of the questions had a misinformation component to it. So if a participant had seen the stop sign, their question said, do you notice the red Datsun failing to stop at a yield sign? For those who have seen the yield sign, the question read, did you notice the red Datsun failing to stop at the stop sign? So there was a misinformation here. If the, the, the thinking was, if they truly remember the car failing to stop at a sign, they're going to remember what sign it was. But lo and behold, most people said, oh yeah, that when they have seen the stop sign, I remember this red Datsun failing to stop at the yield sign, and vice versa. Had they seen the yield sign and given the misinformation statement of the stop sign, they falsely remember having seen the stop sign. Even when they repeated the experiment and they told participants, you might be misinformed. Be careful with the questions. They read the question. Still, there was a high rate of upwards of 36% of people falsely remember being very sure of having seen the stop sign when they saw the yield sign and vice versa. Now, one thing that was striking when I read this paper, which is a very old paper, is that there was a difference in numbers that I was not completely satisfied with. So I, um, I, I imagine a third condition to be able to tell apart how different the, the numerical responses were. I needed to imagine a third condition. So imagine that there is a third condition here. In this third condition, participants also see, a, some participants see a sign, but this sign is a pedestrian crossing. The thought here is that those signs, pedestrian crosses, are very unusual in corners. Most pedestrian crossing signs are in the middle of the streets. They are not usually in the corners, right? So my thinking was, what if we have a third condition in which we see a very unusual sign and we ask exactly the same questions? And what do you think? Of, how many of you think that people are more likely to remember that sign relative to the other two signs? And you will be right. Now imagine that the, the, the sign is even more strange than that. It's kangaroo crossing. Almost everyone will pay attention to the kangaroo crossing and remember it. So that was very interesting for me because that just suggests that the more frequent the sign is given the, the, con the scene, in this case the corner, the more it closes to the distribution. So it's very, very clear in the mean of the distribution. So that's the stop sign. Now, yield signs are almost as regular, uh, regularly found in corners as the stop signs, but not as much, just a little bit less. Now, pedestrian crossings are less to be found in, um, in those kinds of corners. So what my model allows you to show is that uh, the item that you are more likely to misremember is that which is clo closest to the mean of the distribution. In other words, that which is more likely that could have been in that corner is what you are more likely to falsely remember as having been seen before. That's basically what I was interested in. So like, that's why it's so systematic. It's because your memory system behaves to give you the most probable answer given their experiences with certain corners like that. And I think memory just works like that. It's very efficient. You don't have to encode absolutely everything that you see because your system is providing you which what is more likely that could have been in those gaps. So I was very excited about this because, in fact, it dovetails with a lot of really interesting research on memory. So uh, a lot of research suggesting that false alarms are just schema consistent. This had been uh, um, studied for a while by some researchers at Cornell University. Um, and a lot of this schematic knowledge has been done by uh, modifying a beautiful uh, experimental paradigm by uh, Rodinger and McDermott. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that paradigm works. 
What they did, what Rodinger and McDermott did, is that they asked participants to learn lists of words. I'm going to give you an example of one such list of words. You see here it says hot, snow, warm, winter, ice, wet, frigid, chilly, heat, weather, freeze, air, shiver, arctic, and frost. There's a bunch of words. Normally people remember about, if you see a word uh, list like this, normally people remember about half the words from that list. And usually you remember the first words, and the, la the last words, and the ones in the middle, kind of, kind of like murky, right? But here's the, tri the trick. When you have a recognition test later on, and you give uh, people some words that were in the study test and some words that weren't, if the word that wasn't in the test was nonetheless semantically or conceptually related with the words that were studied, almost everyone is going to false alarm as if the word had been in the study list. They call critical lures. So cold, as you can see, is a word that very easily could have been in the first list, right? But if, if the word is um, starship, most likely is that everyone is going to reject that one as not having been in the, in the list, right? So somehow when you encode information, you encode in addition to each specific word or each specific item, you, you encode something like a gist, like a general gist of the information. And that's what it makes you, oh, well, cult must have been there. And your memory system just gives you that, uh, that sense of recognition as if you have seen the word before. Uh, so this schema consistence um, also has occurred with novel objects. So people have trained them in no words we know, but also you can do it with novel objects. And here is one of my absolute favorite examples of a uh, of false alarm that is just or schema consistent, uh, done by uh, Alan Castella at the University of California in Los Angeles. So um, this also is going to reveal, reveal how little I know about American football. But it turns out that um, that in American football teams, many of them have also names of animals. I didn't know that, right? So you probably all do know that. So um, what he did is that he took individuals that um, were experts in, in football, that knew a lot about football, and people like me who know nothing whatsoever about football. I know at my level of ignorance of football is so much that the first time that I saw a football game, I thought that the little lines that they put on the, on the screen were real. Uh, and then they tell you, you know, where to run. So like, this is amazing. You can actually have these lines that they tell you. <laughs> and they weren't. That's the level of, I, I have no idea how the rules or anything like that goes. So I was in the control group, in the control of absolutely ignorant in football. <coughs> now, the thing that is interesting <coughs> is that they gave subjects a number of words of animals and body parts, presumably because both experts in football and non-experts in football are equally experts in body parts. And they give them a list of, of, of animal names and body parts. Now, the critical thing is that some of the animal names were also uh, names of football teams. And when you have critical lures of animal names that were not in the study list, but that nonetheless were uh, of football names of football teams, those that are experts in football, in football are more likely to falsely remember having seen those words that relate to football teams than people that aren't. So this is very strong evidence to the fact that your experiences in the world might affect the likelihood with which you're going to falsely remember something. And according to my model, that um, likelihood is determined by the frequency of the distribution. So here's the, the upshot of the of this part of a talk. So there are differences in learning prior to encoding that can predict the likelihood of falsely recognizing a lure of a certain learned category. I have a bunch of experiments that, uh, that say this more explicitly. They are more boring than the football teams though. Um, memory retrieval, when I was working on this, I said like, look, memory retrieval defaults to contents that could have been. So in, imagine the situation of um, you riding behind that red Datsun. Imagine just for a second, you're riding, driving right behind that red Datsun, the red Datsun fails to stop at the stop sign and crashes. What are you doing? Well, if you're like me, you're trying to avoid the car and your, your attention is, you know, you're paying attention to the wheel, you're paying attention to not hitting the car in the front, you're paying attention to calm down to the pedals and so on. Very little attention was allocated to the stop sign. 
later on, when the policeman asks you, did you fail, did you notice they read that song failing to stop at the stop sign? And then your memory system goes back and reconstructs the scene. You didn't have that information encoded, but the system is created to default to what it is more likely that could have been there. And the system takes stop sign, very likely to have been there, pops, fills the piece of information with a stop sign and comes to you as a memory. But it is probabilistic. Um, and what it suggests is that it defaults to what it is, what could have been the case given previous knowledge and, give, and the present queue. In this case, the queue being the policeman telling you, hey, did you fail, did you notice to fail to stop at the stop sign? So the question that, that followed this sort of realization is, well, do we have any evidence to the fact that our memory system is sensitive to the sorts of hypotheticals, that is to say, contents about past experiences that could have been the case? Well, this led me to a very exciting and now my current uh, main area of research, which is the relationship between episodic memory and um, what I call episodic hypothetical thinking. There was a very influential paper, at least influential in my career, by Dan Schachter and Donna Addis, in which the following sentence um, is extracted. They say, related or gist-based false recognition, the kinds of false alarms and false memory that I told you a, a, a second ago, depends on many of the same neural processes as true recognition and shares relatively little in common with unrelated false recognition. In other words, from the point of view of the brain, when you falsely remember having seen cold in that list that I gave you, um, versus when you truly remember having seen a word like warm, which was in fact in that, in that list, from the point of view of the brain, those two processes look very, very similar relative to when you remember or correctly recognize a word as not having been in the list, like starship. So why is it that falsely remember a relatively similar information that could have been in the list is so similar to truly remembering information that was in the list relative to information that has nothing whatsoever to do with the study list. Why does that happen? Well, one possibility is that the memory system is somehow really, really involved with our capacity to imagine alternative plausible possibilities. So I wanted to find out whether we had evidence of that claim. So uh, that led me to a study of episodic future thinking and later on what I'm gonna talk about, episodic future thinking and hypotheticals. So let me tell you about some really exciting findings in neuropsychology and in neuroscience that have occurred in the last decade. So everyone has seen picture, uh, movies of individuals that have memory problems, right? So if you have seen a movie called Memento, for instance, this is an individual, uh, it's a cool movie, um, if pun intended, it is unforgettable. Uh, it is about an individual that has a memory problem, a memory accident, I mean a brain accident, and as a result of that, this is his capacity to remember episodes that happened in his past. There is, sadly, although this, the, the, this particular individual is, of course, tailored for you know, the movies, but um, there are lots of individuals that have, as a result of damage in a region of the brain called the medial temporal lobe, and specifically a region of the brain of the medial temporal lobe called the hippocampus, um, when you have damage there, you lose your capacity to encode new episodes, new experiences in your life, and as a result of that, you're gonna have real hard time remembering episodes from your life. Um, so we all know about this in studies of individuals with amnesia. Well, it turns out that one of the uh, perhaps most important researchers in memory, uh, Endel Tolving, um, in 1985, he made a an, an sort of a marginal observation of one of his patients, patient KC. In addition to asking him about past events that occurred in, in, in his life, Endel, or Dr. Tolving, decided to ask him about possible events that could occur in his future. I guess that once you have studied a patient for 20 years, a patient with amnesia, you get tired of asking him about the past, so you start asking him about other things. And then Tolving decided to ask him about his future. What do you think is gonna happen next Christmas? Interestingly, Casey had a lot of trouble coming up with an imagination about what might happen in his future. More systematic studies of individuals with medial temporal lobe amnesia, asking them to imagine possible future events have been conducted since. And it turns out that these individuals have a real hard time conjuring up imaginations of possible events that might occur in the future. 
Um, more evidence comes from study with individuals with depression who also have volumetric reductions, that is to say smaller uh, hippocampi and smaller mediotemporal lobes relative to controls. They also have difficulty conjuring up events, simulations about events that might happen in the future. And also individuals with schizophrenia that have so also volumetric reductions in the hippocampus. And there have been done studies with healthy individuals as well in which manipulations that work for episodic memory also work for future thinking. Um, one of my favorite and more clear demonstrations of this um, came from a study conducted by Demis Hassabis and Eleanor Maguire in 2007. What Demis and Eleanor did is that they took um, eight individuals with damage in the medial temporal lobe in the hippocampus bi bilateral. So those little circles there um, indicate two empty spaces that should not be empty. They should be filled with hippocampi, with, with part of the brain called hippocampus. And what they did is that they asked these eight individuals to imagine a series of possible events. So say, imagine that you're laying down on the beach and uh, just tell us what you imagine. And uh, they gave like eight different scenes. Like, uh, another one was in being in a museum, another one was being um, at a fair. Uh, and they just had to talk for three minutes. In addition to that, they asked exactly the same questions to 20 healthy controls. And what they did is that they, um, they score, um, not them, but you know, other people who score, the reports completely um, blind to which group they belong to. And they scored the, what they call spatial coherent index. How spatially coherent, how good, or like how cohesive this narrative of this imagination was. And what they demonstrated is that individuals, the patients to the left, have much lower coherence indexes than healthy controls. In other words, their patients have imaginations that seem more fragmentary. They weren't coherent as when you imagine a narrative and then you just sort of tell a little story for three minutes. That was not at all the way in which they described their imaginations. And what we see is this they happened with the patients but did not happen with the controls. And likewise, we can find also some neuroimaging evidence, uh, starting from work from um, Okuda in 2003 by, and uh, other others work in 2007, showing remarkable overlaps in brain activation um, between memory to your left. This is uh, uh, a map of brain activation in autobiographical memory to your left versus imagining the future. You see the remarkable overlap in brain regions that are engaged in those two tasks. Uh, this also led other people to think, well, if this kind of, this, this brain regions that you see here, the putamen and the prefrontal cortex are engaged in thinking about the past and thinking about the future, what other kinds of simulations might be involved in, um, or in what other kinds of simulations these brain areas might be involved? And it turns out that um, these brain areas, I won't get too much into detail here, but you can ask me in the, the Q&A, they all belong to a specific, um, set of networks that are highly correlated with one another called the default network of the default mode network. And it turns out that these regions are highly engaged in all sorts of different kinds of simulations. Here's a little schematic uh, map of the kinds of simulations that usually engage these brain regions. Thinking about what might happen in the future, this is an individual um, who is uh, about to have a picnic in, a, in this picnic area. So he's thinking about having the picnic in the future. He is also remembering when they brought all the things to put on the table. Um, he is also thinking things from the point of view of uh, his partner. And he is also being sort of projecting himself outside of himself to imagine the scene from a third person perspective. All these kinds of mental simulations engage pretty much the same brain systems. So I was being really, really close um, to to my question, which is, do we have, the, is there a similarity between the memory systems that are involved when we remember versus when we uh, imagine something that could have been the case in the past? But all my research so far, my literature research so far, have shown me that there is a, a, a correlation or a, like a high correlation between thinking about the past and imagining a possible future. But then again, that seems to suggest that there is a very um, weird asymmetry between these two cognitive systems. On the one hand, when you think about the past, you actually only remember what was the case, right? But when you imagine the future, you usually think about possible things that can occur in the future, like a cone of possibilities. So what if, that was my research question, what if 
our memory system, or this brain system actually, is not that asymmetric. What if, in addition to, asking, to Im allowing us to imagine possible futures, it also allows us to imagine possible pasts? I suggest that this whole system allows you to engage in this kind of thinking that I call episodic hypothetical thinking. Most of the re research that I show you has been engaged or involved in episodic future thinking, and what I'm going to show you in a second is my own research involved in episodic counterfactual thinking. So at this stage, being a graduate student as I was, I figured, well, this might be a very dumb question. I am pretty sure that there's a lot of people that already have done research in episodic counterfactual thinking in cognitive neuroscience. And it turns out that there wasn't that much. Most of the research that was being done did not involve memories, but involved only specific decisions. But one thing was very surprising about the research, which is that most research engaged three regions. All these three, one is the orbitofrontal cortex in the front of the brain, the anterior cingulate cortex in the middle front of the brain, and then there is the hippocampus, that should be HIP. That's the hippocampus. And most people just talk about the first two, but nobody talks about the hippocampus because, you know, they say the hippocampus is involved in, in memory. We, we don't care about memory. We're talking about decision making. We're talking about imagination. Nobody talks about memory. So it's like, I want to know what the hippocampus does in episodic uh, uh, counterfactual thinking, if at all. So the first clue to the effect that maybe remembering the past and imagining plausible past events engage very similar cognitive systems and brain systems came from a paper also conducted by Don Addis in which they had one condition in which uh, participants were asked to imagine a possible event in the past that occurred with three objects that they were familiar with. And in that, um, in that paper, they had the following little paragraph. It says, participants imagined past events that had not previously occurred in addition to remembering real past events and imagining future events. Of course, being a philosopher, the first thing that pops out is a past event that did not occur, that is a contradiction. How could it be possible that they imagined past events that did not occur? But this is exactly the concept that I was trying to get at. When we try to remember something that happened in the past and we didn't encode absolutely everything, as in the case of, uh, of the stop sign, your brain tries to go back to an event that did not encode, right? But could very possible, possibly have happened. This is exactly what I was trying to get at. Using different words, this is exactly the concept that I was trying to get at. But again, her study did not specifically address that question. Uh, so what I decided to do was to do it myself. I am going to ask participants to come to the lab and to engage in tasks of either remembering episodes that happened to them in their past or to imagine possible events that could have occurred to them in their past. And I am going to compare their brain activity during those two different tasks. So here's how the experiment went. I asked participants to come to the lab for one first session and to provide me with a bunch of memories that could be either positive or negative. Now, at that point, I was at UNC, so this was actually a positive memory. Okay, you all were me. Sometimes I give this, and I gave this talk a couple of years ago. Uh, and you presented these slides at Duke. They were, at Duke, they thought that was a, obviously a, a negative memory, but at, if you were from UNC, that's a positive memory. So, um, and I extracted some elements from those memories when they were re reporting the memory. So I extracted a context, um, in this case, in a spatial temporal context, as a date and a place, um, an activity or an action, and then an outcome. In this case, the outcome was UNC winning. Um, sometimes the memories were bad. Uh, like last summer, I was in Durham, uh, and I was dro driving Joe's, uh, to Joe's wedding, and I got hit by a truck. So that's the outcome, and the outcome was clearly negative. And then a week later, I asked them to come back to the lab, and then they, I got them in an MRI scanner, um, and I uh, recorded their brain activity whilst they were engaged in one of po four possible tasks. In one task, they simply have to remember an event as it happened, and remember it for 10 seconds. There was another task that had the title positive. If it was a positive memory, what I did is that I took one of their, their negative memories, in this case, for instance, the, the um, going to Joe's wedding and getting hit by a truck, but I changed the outcome from a negative outcome to a positive outcome. Imagine that you managed to avoid the collision. Now, I did also the other way around, in which if they had a positive memory, 
I ask them to imagine a negative outcome, in this case, UNC losing. Or sometimes in a fourth condition, I ask them to imagine the exact same outcome, but through a different means, through a different action. So I change the valence of the outcome, and I ask them to imagine a plausible event in which that had happened. In addition to that, this is, uh, this is important, it's gonna become important in a second, I ask them to rate the, how plausible is that that event could have occurred. Um, so the first thing that I did, I use a very weird statistical method to understand brain uh, data. So um, I don't show brains, but I show bars. And this is what this, what this data means. Um, so the, if all the brain data was completely noise, then you wouldn't see a difference between the bars ones going up and the other ones going down. What this, uh, what this um, uh, data shows you is how similar each condition is from the point of view of the brain activity. So if you imagine that the brain activity is, uh, is you know, in, goes in one direction here in blue, which is the remembering condition, and the control condition is in red, they are very, very different from one another. That's what they're separated and they're completely separated. But all the contrafactual conditions are pretty similar to one another and very different from a different condition. Um, so that's what this, was this data say. So the first thing that um, that study suggested to me is like, look, there is a lot of similarities in brain activity between uh, remembering the past and imagining possible events that occurred in the past relative to another task in which they have to think of sentences. But this quite didn't answer my question. And the reason for that is the obvious reason, which is that maybe the person was asked to imagine avoiding the collision, but from the point of view of that person, that was a very unlikely event. And what I wanted to get was the person's subjective judgment of likelihood. When a person thinks this is very likely that could have happened, and when a person remembers the event happening, that's what I wanted to see. So what I did is that I took the ratings of likelihood of each one individual event that they imagined, and I re all the trials and created two groups, groups of counterfactuals or imaginations that they consider were very likely, and imag imaginations that they consider were very unlikely. Yes, this could have happened in the past, but it would have been very, very unlikely. And now I looked for similarities in brain activity. And what I found, which was very striking and very happy um, finding, is that when the brain remembers an event that did happen, or when the brain imagines something that is very, very likely, that the person thinks is very, very likely that could have occurred, the brain activity is very, very similar to one another. But when they imagine something that is unlikely that could have happened, the brain behaves very differently. And more important for me, when you remember the event, or when you imagine something that it is very likely that could have happened, our friend, the hippocampus, is highly engaged. So that was, uh, sort of the discovery that, the, that allowed me to see, you see, that cone of possibilities. When people think something is very likely that could have occurred in the past, or when people imagine something is very likely that might occur in the future, allows you to have this sort of symmetry in the cognitive systems that, that permit you to mentally tra uh, travel back and forth in time. So, episodic contrafactual simulations are these very interesting kinds of thoughts, kinds of imaginations, that uh, for some people um, allow us to rehearse alternatives to past events, and some people suggest that we think about alternatives to past events because we want to sort of hedge future uncertainty. We want to have a leg up in future events that might be similar to what happened in the past. But of course, uh, so one possibility is suppose that you make a mistake when you're uh, playing poker, and said, oh, next time that this happened, I am going to do this instead. You rehearse alternative way in which that event could have occurred, and you think next time that this happened, I'm gonna do something different. But of course, how effective that simulation is next time that it happens is highly dependent on how well you remember you having simulated that counterfactual in the past. So, um, and previous research has shown that, for instance, positive memories are remembered better over time relative to negative memories, or that positive episodic future thoughts are better remembered than relative to negative and uh, neutral episodic future thoughts. But so far, no. Um, um, we don't know a whole lot about our memory for imaginations, for counterfactual imaginations, or imaginations as, as, about alternative past events. So to sort of test for how good are we at imagining counterfactual thoughts, I conducted the following study, and I, and I like to, to talk about this study because, um, and, and again, this is part of the, of the autobiographical component of this talk, um, 
This is the first component, the first experiment that I conducted, actually not the first, the third experiment that I conducted um, in my postdoc. Uh, the first two experiments failed. Many of the experiments that I have conducted in my life have failed. Maybe five out of seven or so that I've conducted failed. That's, I hope, normal. Um, and this one failed, but it failed at a point in which I was very nervous because um, my boss, who is very nice, um, is not um, very effusive with his emotions. So I was feeling that I was letting him down, and I was like, he's going to fire me. This is terrible. I need one experiment that worked. And I was thinking that this experiment was going to work. And um, spoiler alert, it doesn't work. But it doesn't work in a very important way. So here is how the experiment went. In the first session, I had individuals come to the lab and recollect uh, 30 positive, 30 negative, and 30 neutral autobiographical memories. Then in the second session, a week later, they come and they imagine alternative ways in which those events could have occurred. I ask them to imagine a way in which, uh, but with a particular twist, I give them a random object. And I imagine, I ask them, imagine that this object would have been in that scene, in that event that happened to you in the past. And imagine that with this object, somehow you have made this event better. This is actually, it's a sad, true story. Um, when I was 12, uh, my mom gave me for my birthday a skateboard. Um, I think that you are all aware about my incapabilities for sports. Uh, this goes as far back as uh, always. So when I was 12, I was equally incapable for sports. So I was terrible at skateboarding. Um, and I fell very badly. It was a terrible fall. And I hit my face in the sidewalk. And I cut like half my face in the, in the sidewalk. It was painful, both for my pride and for my face. Um, and and that, that event was ne a negative memory, obviously. So imagine that that was one of my autobiographical memories. And, uh, and then I come to the lab, and, and I'm asked to imagine an alternative way in which that event could have happened. And the random object that is given to me is a pillow. So of course I imagine, oh, maybe I had a pillow right in behind me in my backpack or whatever. And when I was about to fall, I pull out the pillow, and I avoid this horrible scar that prevented me from yet another month from having a girlfriend. Uh, so. <laughs> So that, that, is a, that is an imagination, something that could have happened with this very random object, a, a pillow, right? And then um, in the session three, which was either 10 minutes or a day later, um, I present uh, subjects with the exact same component, and the task consists in remembering what this random object was. The thought was, um, you know, how well they remember that random object is a good indication of how well they encoded that simulation. So I was expecting to see an emotional effect. That is to say, I was expecting to see that maybe negative memories would, or negative counterfactuals better, would be better remembered than positive ones. Um, and this is very sad. There is absolutely no effect of valence. In other words, negative, neutral, and positive memories were equally remembered. The only event that I find, the only effect that I find is that they were worse at remembering the objects one day later, but that's completely expected. <laughs> So I was sad. I finished the experiment, collected all the data, did all the analysis, had my 20 subjects, and lo and behold, the only effect that I found was the absolutely obvious and completely uninteresting event that people forget stuff from one day to another. Uh, so I was sad, and I went back home, and I was like, you know, my boss is going to fire me. Um, one year later, it occurred to me that I had also collected data about uh, how plausible each individual thought that that event could be. What's the plausibility of me pulling out a pillow uh, when I am about to fall on a skateboard? It's very minimal. That's a very unlikely event. But what if some people created imaginations with these random objects, and they also thought, eh, actually, that is very plausible? So what I did one year after I collected this data was to reanalyze the data but this time separating those simulations that subjects thought were very likely that could have happened versus those simulations that they thought were very unlikely that could have happened. And I wanted to see now how well they remembered it. And lo and behold, I find this beautiful effect. The, more, the objects of the likely simulations are much better remembered than the objects of the unlikely simulations. And that made an enormous amount of sense. If I was right to the fact that the memory system 
as part of this much larger system that allows you to create imaginations, hypothetical imaginations for the future and also for the, fa for the past. And that in addition to that, are felt by the subject as being very likely that could have occurred or that might occur, well, you want to spend much more cognitive resources remembering stuff that is likely or that might be likely to have happened in the future relative to crazy stuff that it is very unlikely that could have happened. Why would I want to remember a pillow? The chances of me ever, the chances of me ever getting into a skateboard, minimal, let alone the chances of me falling with a backpack with a, with a pillow in the back. Why do I spend resources in remembering such an unlikely possible contrafactual. So here's the take home message. Details from episodic contrafactual simulations we consider likely are better remembered than details from episodic simulations we consider unlikely. And contrary to episodic future thinking, this effect appears to be independent, independent of the valence of the simulation. And here's the explanation, just rehashing what I just told you. While deploying more memory resources during the construction of likely relative to unlikely episodic counterfactuals, our memory system might be better equipped to remember what we consider is more likely to have occurred. So what about other self-relevant simulations? So, so far I have been talking about people and, and, and like uh, crazy objects, but um, what about other kinds of mental simulations? Uh, in one of my most recent papers, what we did is that we compare subjects thinking about possible events that could have happened to them, that could have happened to other people, or that could have happened to objects. Here, what I was interested was to see whether the, these core areas of the brain were engaged when we were thinking about um, possible counterfactual events that happened to people uh, versus what happened to objects. And what we see here, the, the um, graph is a little bit convoluted, but what we see here, the four columns to the left, uh, you're already familiar with these kinds of graphs, suggest that brain activity in those four tasks is very similar relative to the other task. Now the task, the gray task, is thinking about how objects, no people, how objects could have been different. And some of the tasks are things like, imagine that um, uh, stoplights had purple instead of red, or imagine uh, that, um, what, what was another? Think, Im imagine uh, teapots that, um, that had like different kinds of handles. I forgot exactly what the tasks were, but they were all like very concrete objects that did not involve people. So when you imagine how objects could have been, the brain behaves very differently. In fact, when you see, imagine people, you see again, very similar, the core network that I was talking about. But when we imagine how objects could have been different, um, you see a very different kind of brain activation. So let me just take stock uh, from the whole talk and how this thing sort of hang together. The first point that I made is that expertise, understood as the relative frequency of exposure to certain items, influences what we false alarm to, what we falsely remember. In a sense, I suggest that our memory system constructs contents that fill in gaps probabilistically with what is more likely that could have been the case given the cue and stored information. Now, fMRI evidence suggests that many of the same neural mechanisms involved in episodic recollection are also engaged during episodic hypothetical thinking, for instance, future thinking or contractual thinking. So with all this in hand, I was finally able to, go back, to get back to my initial philosophical curiosity. It turns out that many false and distorted memories are not the product of a malfunctioning memory system. So philosophers are wrong in thinking that uh, our memory system, when, it, when we have a false memory, is because the memory system is malfunctioning. Oftentimes, it's just functioning fine. Many false and distorted memories are reconstructed in the exact same way in which very <coughs> memories are reconstructed. Remembering, as I said, is not an act of reproduction, but of reconstruction. Now, it is not haphazard reconstruction. It is probabilistic. Many of the same cognitive and neural mechanisms that are employed for recollective reconstruction are redeployed during episodic hypothetical thinking, both future and past. This idea appears to be novel, but it turns out it is not. Many philosophers, specifically uh, uh, Hobbes and, and David Hume, have suggested that imagination and memory are but one thing. This is Hobbes, which for diverse considerations had different names. And Hume suggested memory and imagination share operations. And part of my research, in addition to all the research that I have talked about, is that um, 
these guys might actually be true, might be right. It might be true that memory and imagination really, really are very intertwined, very connected with one another. Thank you.